The next presentation is virtual field trip to Tree of Life Nursery and updates on Hawaii Native Ornamentals Research, uh, Dr. Orville Baldos. Dr. Orville Baldos is an assistant researcher in sustainable ornamental production at the Department of Tropical Plant Sciences, University of Hawaii at Manoa. His research interests include, number one, Native Hawaiian plant materials development for landscape and ornamental use. <clears throat> Secondly, screening and selection of non-invasive ornamental species. And number three, development of sustainable ornamental plant production and landscape management practices. And Dr. Orville Baldos. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so today I'm just going to share with you because um, we, we did a field trip to California in April um, and we went to this um, native plant nursery and uh, we just looked a lot, uh, visited the, the nursery and then looked around and see what they got and yeah, so and then the ha second half would be uh, some research updates on my uh, native plant research. <coughs> Okay, so uh, why use native plants as ornamentals? Um, actually, it's gaining popularity not only in Hawaii, but also at the national level. Um, uh, people are now more um, uh, informed about, it's not more than just aesthetics now. Um, so uh, we have issues such as water use conservation, biodiversity conservation. Here in Hawaii, it's invasive species spread. Um, so. We plant native plants for uh, these reasons, including stormwater management, uh, providing pollinators, and having a sense of place, because Hawaii isn't Hawaii without the native plants. Uh, there was actually a recent survey by the American um, Society of Landscape Architects, and native plants is actually uh, in their top, uh, in the top of the list, uh, top 10 list of uh, what people are looking for in their residential landscapes. So we visited the Tree of Life Nursery in April of this year. Uh, it's located just south of Los, Chan Los Angeles and then um, north of o Oceanside. So it's, a, it's an, a big nursery. They have over 500 species of, uh, and varieties of native plants for landscaping and also ecological restoration. Their nursery is about 40 acres in Rancho Mission, um, San Juan Capistrano, California. They're the largest uh, native plant supplier in California. And their services include um, plants that are specific to a site-specific provenance. So um, they have uh, native plants that uh, are from specific locations. They also have a couple of rare and endangered species, uh, some containerized and bare root, bare root plants. And then for restoration purposes, they have a, a huge production area for large quantities of native plants. So these are the owners uh, who toured us around. So this is Jeff Bond and Mike Evans. So the nursery started about 30 years ago. Uh, it was strictly a wholesale nursery at first, but the general found uh, the general public found about it and they kept coming. Um, the they they found it a hassle, but um, they if they were hoping to sell the native plants to the retail uh, nurseries, but. Uh, the retail nurseries were, uh, at that time, were not interested in native plants. Um, this is at the same time uh, where the big box stores were uh, growing or were, were building uh, guard, retail garden centers and that added pressure to the retail, the, the, the local nursery. So they, the retail nurseries weren't really um, uh, happy or they didn't really want to try something new and out of the ordinary because they were already struggling with, um, with selling their plants due to competition with the national chains. So people found, their, found the nursery and then they, people kept coming. So what they did was they decided to open a retail space. So this is part of their retail store. Uh, so they sell various native California plants, so from grasses to sedges. Um, they also have different Ceanothus, which is uh, a native there, with different selections also. That was probably, I think it was developed by the UC Davis system. So a couple more selections of Ceanothus. 
So the retail area was previously their parking lot. So this is a picture of, I, I got from their Instagram page, they were uh, renovating their retail space. So before and after. So now their retail space is actually a big part of their business. So this is uh, part of the retail space wherein they're showcasing their, their goods. Uh, beside that small garden, they also have a small bookstore called uh, Casa La Paz. So they store uh, a, a bunch of stuff in there. Um, the house is actually built of straw and mud. And this is what's, what the inside looked like. So it's uh, kind of like a house with, with books around. So people, uh, they actually stock the area or the, the, the bookstore with books, uh, original art also that they liked. Uh, basically, the stuff that they believed in, uh, they're not selling any chemical fertilizers or uh, garden chemicals. They only have a couple of pruning shears. So, so that's what the inside looks like. So they also sell uh, some native seeds in seed packets. And uh, they also have a wreath making workshop that they have. So uh, this is actually a wreath that they made, I think, in February. And it's still nice. So they're still displaying it in their bookstore. Uh, they also sell different types of pots. And artwork, so uh, they have a friend who's an artist, and um, he exhibits his work at that um, bookstore. Uh, also, different types of books uh, in the bookstore. Uh, they also invite the authors of these books to have a presentation in, in, in their bookstore. Um, in November of last year, actually, uh, people from there, uh, this is an indigenous group from Mexico. Um, they actually went to the, I, I guess the nursery invited them, and they, they sold their goods, and they had workshops, free workshops and events in, in the nursery. Uh, this is a painting workshop in the nursery. So they have free workshops, basically ranging from horticulture to botany. Uh, to birding, hiking, native foods, native cultures, and insects. Uh, this picture over here is a wreath-making workshop for uh, December of last year. Uh, and their workshops, basically half is invited speakers, and then the other half of the workshops that they do are in-house. So this is uh, another activity that they have for, for kids. Uh, so having uh, native plants, having uh, planting them in pots. And then they have birding talks, which is offered uh, four times a year. So basically what they do, aside from growing native plants, they want to keep people in their property. So it's more of like a eco-agritourism thing. Um, so they have a barn that they can convert into an event space. They also have an outdoor classroom uh, for those workshops. And they're thinking about maybe having food trucks or a cafe in the, in the nursery eventually. Now let's go to the operation. So uh, the barn is their propagation facility. So uh, this was actually built on a site, the same site where uh, an existing propagation facility burned down, unfortunately, due to a coffee maker. Um, so they all lost everything to that fire. And um, so th this new barn serves uh, different functions. So they have seeds. So this is actually a, a small seed storage uh, facility that they have. So it uses natural cooling because it's um, well, it gets cold in there. So uh, so they keep the seeds in there. Uh, their seed collections are tracked by a database. And um, in some species that they work on, um, they're stimulated, for, uh, fire stimulated. So they burn the flats, which I'll show you uh, a little bit later. Uh, they also propagate from cuttings and use, they use perlite as their medium. And uh, plant propagation, pro propagators transplant seedlings. So this is the, what the barn looks like. So you have a 
was instructor. They have chandeliers over there also. So, so it can serve as different purposes. So this is their potting area in the barn. And then this is a picture on Instagram that they're, uh, they're burning pine needles on top of uh, seed flats because uh, the seeds that they planted there is a fire adapted species. And then this is the uh, picture of their um, screen house. Uh, so this is for the cuttings, um, seedlings to protect it from frost. So this is a little bit bigger when they're potted up into bigger pots. This is their outside shade house. Well, I guess shade structure, not really a house. Then these are uh, a bunch of native plants that uh, will be going to a client's property. So they are uh, exclusive contractors. So they landscape residential areas and then the uh, the clients get a rebate from uh, landscaping with native plants because uh, water is an issue in California. So that's another view of the shade structure with more plants. Uh, this is their soil mixing facility. So you have the um, wheelbarrow. I believe this is their pesticide um, shed over here. Then this is their uh, media mixing area. It's a very big area. I imagine it's 40 acres big, so yeah. Uh, what's interesting with this nursery is that they have a tissue culture lab. So this lab used to be uh, a lab wherein they grow mycorrhizal um, inoculum. So there was a, an employee of theirs who was doing a PhD, I think, and um, she was doing microbial inoculants for native plants. So it served as a lab for those. Uh, and then it's the, the research, uh, the, the employee eventually got a job somewhere else and the, the lab was just um, abandoned there. And then they revived it and now it's a micropropagation facility for uh, woody species and also for germinating native ferns because native ferns uh, in California, it's, uh, not much, it's, it's not much in the trade yet, so they want to um, have uh, more available uh, selections of that one or varieties. Uh, aside from micropropagation, they're still culturing antagonistic uh, fungi, so Trichoderma phy phy phytophthora, because they have phytophthora issues also in, in, in California. So this is what's inside of the nursery. So this is Kevin. He's actually a graduate of UH Hilo um, and now works with the nursery. So I have glassware. They have a mini um, pressure cooker for sterilizing their media. And they also have a microwave for sterilization purposes. This is where uh, their culture room is. So they have um, these, these are the woody tissue cultures. And they also have the spore, um, they germinate the spores in like Chinese takeout boxes. And um, so they, they do with uh, whatever they have. So uh, Kevin is just showing um, the container boxes and they're, um, he sterilizes this in the microwave and puts perlite inside and then you have the spores uh, on top. So it, he germinates it in there. And then once um, the gametophytes, uh, I guess the alternation of gener generations, they, uh, once they form the, the, the uh, small fern plantlet, then he transfers it to a bigger um, container. Yeah. Okay, so that's it for the uh, field trip. Uh, this is a little bit of updates on what I'm doing in terms of research. So um, I have a couple of species that I'm looking at for landscape and also for indoor use. So uh, Aveo Veo, so this is a, a native Hawaiian endemic. Um, here in uh, Hawaii Island, it actually ranges, you can find it on Saddle Road as a tree and also um, on the coastal areas as a small shrub. So we 
collected some accessions from Molokai and was uh, were able to select like two types of um, plant forms that are uh, might be useful for the landscape. Uh, also, uh, currently looking on uh, Paohiyaka as a hanging basket plant. Um, also looking at Ilima as a hanging basket or container plant. And then there's these two Peperomia species that I'm looking for um, in, uh, as an indoor plant. So Aveo Veo, so it's a drought tolerant shrub that's found on all <coughs> islands. Uh, so we have selected prostrate and compact forms. So the prostrate ones are just hugging the ground and then compact forms. It grows up to about two feet high. Um, so it's a low shrub form. Um, it, it can be easily propagated from cuttings, and it has potential use as a landscape ground cover and uh, container plant. So the low shrub form, two feet high, about four feet wide, if it's planted uh, just uh, by itself. Uh, we've been trimming it lightly with a <laughs> hedge trimmer, and I think it tolerates that. Um, but I would suggest planting it uh, for, like, if you have naturalized or natural looking landscapes with minimal uh, trimming, that would be uh, the ideal place where it will be planted. And I've seen, since we've planted this for about a year, I've seen minimum pests. Um, and I've seen some beneficial insects being uh, around the plant. Um, I would recommend planting this with Ilima and Pauhuiaka because Ilima can get mealy bug so uh, maybe the beneficials from this plant might go to the elima and that can keep it in check. Uh, the only downside that I see with this uh, particular selection is it uh, if it's too dry the older leaves um, shed and then they get a little lanky and like uh, leggy. So this is a picture of the kinopodium with one of the beneficial insects in there. And um, we planted a native trial garden in, uh, in campus. So this is at Parney Circle in Manoa. So we have the kinopodium with other native Hawaiian plants. So this was in January. Uh, this was just this uh, past month. So we, we did replant actually this area over here with uh, kinopodium again because um, this area seems to be there there seems to be some sort of soil issue or maybe it's too dry whereas the other side there they're perfectly fine so so still looking at that observ observing um, we also have some plantings that we started at the Magoon research station so this was in November of last year and uh, this was March so you can see that the Ave Ave has grown quite big and still low. Now we added more native plants in there. So this is still March. This was in June, so it's a little bigger. The, the shrubs a little higher. October, just uh, yes, the other day. So it's, it's a little bigger now. It's completely filling the space. So yeah, so you can just trim it lightly so that the sign isn't uh, uh, obstructed. So that's the shrubby form of Aveo Veo. So this next uh, form is the prostrate one. So it's a creeping habit. Um, it doesn't really cover a lot of ground. It, there's still some spaces. So I would recommend uh, using it in like cinder beds or maybe even in uh, hanging baskets. So containerized. So same as uh, the shrubby form of Aveo Veo, it has minimum pests and also can house beneficial insects. So again, this can be planted alongside with Ilima or Pauhiyaka. And then eventually, yes, another downside of this selection is that it can get scraggly also if it's too dry. So this is a picture of uh, that prostrate Aveo Veo as a container hanging basket plant. So we're trying to figure out if like what sort of uh, techniques we can do to make it more bushy. Uh, the next plant is Ilima. So this particular selection came from Maui. Um, 
So it's a coastal shrub found on all islands. You have uh, the ones in the coast are usually prostrate and grayish with grayish looking leaves. And the mountain types are dark green leaves and usually bigger flowers. Um, so this uh, selection can be easily propagated from cuttings. Uh, the uses for this one would be as a container plant or as a natural, for, for natural looking landscapes or cinder beds. Uh, Elima, as you all know, it has a lot of flowers which attracts bees, so it's a pollinator friendly plant. So companion plants, again, Avea Avea and Paulhiaca, because they usually are found uh, alongside, on, on, like naturally found on the coast. Um, these three species are always with each other. Uh, it can get scraggly if it's too dry, uh, the irrigation. And it's a mealybug mag magnet. Like, well, all Elima are, there's no mealybug resistant Elima uh, that I've found so far. So um, in terms of pest management, maybe we need to find uh, a way to manage the mealybugs with, with this selection. Then the third species is uh, Paohiaka. So it's a coastal perennial herb. Uh, so it's an endemic uh, vine. As you can see here, I have six different selections uh, that were collected from different areas, mostly Maui and Oahu. And then there's one from the Big Island. So you can see that uh, even within a species, there, there is differences that you can select for. Uh, so we're Right now, we're looking at it as a hanging basket plant. Uh, propagation is very easy from cuttings. You can get three node cuttings and use that for propagation. Uh, pest that I've seen when we're growing it is mainly the sweet potato um, worm. Uh, we rarely see aphids or me uh, mealybugs or uh, spider mites. So I believe uh, when, I guess it, they only come out when the plants are really stressed out. So these are the three selections that we look for um, use as a hanging basket plant. So Puhala, which is a Maui accession, has pale blue flowers, uh, pubescent leaves. Uh, this particular selection has a really nice wavy leaf pattern so that makes it unique. Uh, Mahana, which is a South Point uh, Big Island um, selection, it has white flowers, uh, medium pubescence, green stem, uh, and then the leaves are also pubescent. And then this one, we got, it's called Lion Arboretum because we got the seedling from Lion Arboretum. Uh, when I asked the seed bank manager where they got it from, uh, the farthest that we could go was the Leeward Community College Native Plant Garden. So, so this one has white flowers. So usually this is, uh, the Paohiaka you usually see has dark green flowers and blue flowers. This one has white flowers and dark green leaves. Um, it also has dark purplish uh, red stems, but no hairy, uh, no pubescence at all. So right now we're doing hanging basket uh, research, so trying to find out how to pinch or how often do you have to pinch the, the plant to get it uh, into a bushy state. Uh, we also are looking at chemical pinching treatment, so trying to spray uh, using Atrimec or Configure to increase branching. So this one is the control, this one is uh, uh, medium pinching, and this one is like pinched every, I think, the three or four times already. Then this one is Puhala Bay, and this is the control. Uh, this is like medium, and then a lot more pinching involved. Uh, but when we compare the two selections like Lion Arboretum and Puhala, this one seems to uh, need a little bit less pinching than the other. Then the fourth, uh, the other species that we're looking at is Ala Ala Vainui. So it's a pepper, uh, these are peperomia species. So we have about 25 species here in Hawaii. Uh, two are indigenous and then the rest are endemic. So it's only found here. As you can see in this picture, you have varying leaf shapes and colors, which can be potentially selected for indoor use. Uh, it's a native succulent, and suc succulents are actually trending right now. So you can ride through that um, trend. 
Uh, we have trialed four species so far for indoor use, so Peperomecuchiana, Banda, Sandwichensi, which is really nice, and then Oahuensi. Uh, we've looked at leaf cuttings for propagating these species. So for of those four species, uh, Sandwichensi is the only one that didn't really have good results with rooting. I, we only get 15% rooting uh, with leaf cuttings, while the rest ca you can get up to like 80% or higher. So our next phase is to look at uh, tissue culture of these um, uh, this species for uh, in, in terms of leaf sections. Um, my previous graduate student started the tissue culture work, so we have some success uh, with uh, getting some plantlets out of this medium. So we need to uh, the one of the challenges for this research is trying to optimize the sterilization technique because. If it's too much, uh, you kill the whole leaf section. If it's too little, then you have contaminants. So I just got a grant um, from the college uh, to collect more peperomia species. And then uh, part of the research that we'll do is the tissue culture work. So uh, hopefully starting by spring of next year. So aside from the propagation, we also did the uh, indoor trials. So we have different levels of light, so window, office conditions, and then low light are kill treatment. As you can see here, most of the plants have died already. Uh, we collected monthly survival data. And the results of that indoor trial indicates that P. sandwichensis, the one that doesn't propagate readily, uh, basically tolerated the, 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 the low light conditions because you had uh, up to 80% actually survival even at the low light conditions. Uh, we had poor survival of the Blanda, Kukiana, and Oahu NC, about 30% under office and light conditions. But we had uh, good survival with Blanda under window conditions. So even within species, there's differences in tolerance to light levels. So for our conclusion, so we can potentially use P. sandwichensis as an indoor native Hawaiian plant because um, it can tolerate low uh, light conditions. Blanda maybe marginally can be used, but as long as you put it uh, close to a window, like a bright light, then you should be okay. So uh, I have some of these selections except for the sandwich senses. So if you are interested in uh, testing, I can give you some stem cuttings for propagation. Because, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to f have, uh, I guess, manage different locations. So I would like to just give the material to the uh, people who are interested and then just report back to me wh what happened. So, <laughs> so yeah. So uh, I'd like to thank my student help, the uh, Magoon Research Station, Lion Arboretum for uh, providing some of the plant material for this study. John Chen from Jobsom, who did the stats for the survival. And then this project was funded by uh, the USDA, NIFA, uh, Hatch Project, and then the Hawaii Department of Agriculture New Gem, <coughs> Germplasm Grant. So any questions? Yes. Could you speak to the legislation that said <clears throat> by 2018, you have to have 20% of all state projects planted with native plants? And then it yeah. scales up to 30. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Good. Has that helped your research at all? Or? Mm, in terms of getting funding, <laughs> it's very hard. <laughs> no orders? No. No orders. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Yes. Is anybody looking at native Biden species? Not that I know of. <coughs> like selecting. Uh, the designers like to use vines now. It's becoming mm -hmm. unpopular. Uh, material you design. Are any of these, have you ever tested them uh, with maybe te Tessie's yeah. uh, side on um, the application of cut foliage for design? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the Puhala seems to be holding pretty good in terms of like just cutting it and um, in, in having it in water. So I actually uh, told Tessie about it and I guess you're forwarding it to the florist and see if they're interested.
Um, do you know which um, <coughs> plants are the most popular in use in the uh, native landscape right now? Well, the more common ones are pohinahina, napaka, yeah, akia. <laughs> you see it all over, but um, in terms of selecting, because uh, uh, there is a variegated nopaka and there's, there is a variegated pohinahina. So there's, um, I'm still, I'm waiting to get those plants so we could release it. So yeah, those are the most popular, but there's, uh, in terms of selections within those species, there's not much uh, availability in, in those. Yes. Is your um Research is market driven or uh, how is the market for the product? Uh, it's more about the legislation that drives the research. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, I will be sending uh, Judy or Eric the information on the legislation that says by, I think it was this year, all state projects had to be landscape projects had to be 10% native and then it scales up to 15 and then up to 30, 35 by 2030. And so I guess the supply would be the important thing. So if growers are interested in growing, especially now with all the restoration happening on state projects, you know, we're going to have to incorporate the natives. Yeah.